let's uh, begin our session with uh, 10 times Amitofo. 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 Amitofo, everyone. Thank you for uh, today's session, coming for today's session. So uh, today we'll continue chapter three of uh, Leo Fan's four lessons, um, Cultivating Goodness. So we have uh, mentioned about the types of goodness that was being confirmed. There are many types of goodness and to categorize them, they are in total of eight pairs. We have mentioned the first five. Just for the summary sake, I mean, for revision sake, we'll just have to, uh, we'll, we'll re I'll briefly go through it. So we talk about, um, they want to talk about examples of cultivating goodness, and then he categorized them into eight pairs. And the first five is uh, real and false, or real and fake. Second pair is um, crook and straight. Third pair is hidden and obvious. And the fourth pair is uh, proper, sorry, right and wrong. And the fifth pair is proper and improper. Um, now we're talking about the sixth pair, which is half and full. Last week, I uh, have trouble trying to find a word for uh, proper and improper, but I end up using the original translation because um, they, uh, what they're trying to say is it's not, it's not like a um, very clean cut in terms of goodness. It's always, um, there is a, always, a, how to say, mixed up in there. It's very hard to cultivate pure goodness. It's just trying to tell us uh, we need to work harder to achieve that level. So for um, proper and improper, I'd just like to uh, re-emphasize again because the rest are quite clear as we talked about last week. Um, proper and improper, we talk about a prime minister who has a very kind heart, but um, because he, um, because, but because of his kind heart, he allowed the offender to... Uh, fester their bad habits and ends up being in a dead role. That means a death, um, death sentence. So he felt uh, regrettable uh, of not uh, giving that offender who you know um, uh, repeated. I mean, who, who who was drunk back then and offended him in the in his presidents without any reason so in back then it's supposed to be you know a, a simple punishment like a bit of whip or something like that would put him in shape but um we talk about the context of ancient times but because he did not he, he's trying to be kind because of his personal kindness he forgot to give him a, a proper lesson so that he would never you know do things out of uh, recklessness uh, instead of thinking it through. That's the problem. So because of um, his kind heart, he ended up doing something that are not proper. So there are the opposite example of um, a rich merchant who has encountered a famine in his area. Um, however, uh, this famine has caused a lot of, uh, you know, hunger, and those poor farmers who has no, um, because of drought, they have no uh, crops. They go and rob on the streets, and this rich merchant were not, were not as noble as we thought. He, they are. He only wants to protect his property and his own wealth, so he tried to sue to this, you know, robbers in the court, but. You know, the magistrate were not uh, maybe out of capacity or just don't care because it's too much. Because famine, right? Every, everywhere, everyone's hungry, so everyone's doing this. So he ended up using his own private uh, guts to punish these robbers. And it, unintentionally, it brings out an effect of stability in the, in the, in the village. So this is the, another example of um, 
a proper in in a improper in proper in a proper. So um, uh, when we do uh, look at the events of the world, I think it's what he's trying to teach us is try not to uh, go uh, how to say quick. Quickly jump into the judgments, and we should wait and see how how it bring up, what kind of effect it brings up, whether that person's intention is good or not. Um, so we continue with the next one is half and full. So this one is quite uh, obvious: half goodness and full goodness. But why half? Why full? And how how do you define something as um, half and something as full? So there is an example of a. Uh, I'm using all Leo Fan's example, but uh, a old, I mean, a young woman who was um, not really rich back in Ming Dynasty, and she uh, went into a temple uh, trying to pray for good health and good wealth and stuff like that. Uh, she's very sincere and uh, repent maybe, and she um, donated only like two dollars. Something like that. Back then, it's maybe she's very poor. She can't afford a, a, a sizable amount, but she donated to them. But the monk, the abbot of the monastery, himself uh, host a repentance ceremony instead of uh, finding a small his own disciples or something like that. So it it, it shows that you know the abbot uh, takes this very um, sincerely, seriously, and very thankful to her, even though it's just two dollars. So after after a few years, she has been selected as an imperial concubine, and as usual, she becomes rich and uh, with prestige and status because she's an empress woman. And she went back to the temple and you know to repay thanks for the blessings. And she bought like a cart full of golds and you know silvers and all the uh, uh, rich, sizable amount of donation. However, the monk did not come out this time to host her um, ceremony or her repentance and she, she he just uh, sent out his own disciple to uh, host the event and she's like last time I have given you only two dollars but the abbot himself comes out and um, bless you know, this ceremony but why today um, you only send your own disciple so the among the abbots say that last time even though your uh, material uh, ability I mean your wealth material wealth is uh, very uh, small uh, it's very poor but your heart is full of sincerity and kindness if I do not come out uh, by myself to host your repentance ceremony then I could not um, repay this kind of sincerity that you had but right now, even though you are with um, high prestige, high position, uh, when you donate the money, your heart is not full. So you have mixed in a little bit of arrogance or a little bit of... Because when you get to the level, you feel proud. So you have some pride and arrogance in there. It's not full sincerity. So my own student would be enough. Doesn't need me, doesn't need myself. So if we put it in modern context, if some... Uh, like random like normal people who, who are very sincere and you know go into a temple uh, like here and then join the Fahui or trying to uh, invite a monk to host some sort of um, housewarming in his own place and venerable himself my master himself come and uh, do the ceremony and um, because that person is sincere but in the other hand if some rich merchant or powerful people comes and they you know even though they give a lot of uh, money donation but if their heart obviously these are cultivated people they can see through the the, the 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 surface they will they can see through you basically and understand are you really real or are you um, filled with a uh, filled with a bit of pride and all that afflictions so um, same thing over here so this is half and this is full it's not based on the wealth it's not based on the material um, uh, wealth but it's based on how sincere you are, how real you are, you know, how true you are. Um, and this is something we have to ask ourselves. So another case, uh, there is a Taoist, um, we call it Shen Xian. In, in uh, English, I call it, we call it immortals, but they are mortals, they will die. But um, those cultivated uh, people in Taoism, 
uh, call it, uh, yeah, just cultivated people. And Mr. Lu is the most famous one, Lu Dongbing. Uh, he has a teacher who teach him an art of uh, alchemy, in a sense, the trans, tran, transforming uh, one metal to another. Obviously, transforming iron to gold, right? Want it to be more um, valuable. And he teach him this art of uh, transmutation, right, we call it. Uh, this art of transforming one form of matter to another. So he teach him how to transform iron to gold because it can save a lot of people. You can use the gold to save people. Those people are cultivated. They are not worldly people. That's why they teach him the lesson because he can use the power for good. However, Mr. Liu, uh, before he accepts these teachings, he asks, um, does it change in the end? Obviously, it does. 500 years ago, said his teacher. So Mr. Liu said, if that's the case, then I just um, set up a trap for the people who will inherit this goal 500 years later. Uh, and then his teacher say, with this kind of, uh, and then Mr. Liu said, I do not want to be that person who set up others 500 years later. It's not right. So his teacher replied, uh, to cultivate as a immortals, like in one of the uh, um, spiritual level, uh, higher, higher, higher spiritual level in Taoism, we call it Xian. You need to accumulate 3,000 uh, merits, meritorious deeds. So you need to do 3,000 types of meritorious deeds. However, your one word has, this word that you have right now, this, not just word, his heart actually, your, your heart at this moment equals to that 3,000 meritorious deeds. So what happened is because of his, um, he has the opportunity to learn this art and he has the opportunity to just take it and do it. No one will stop him. But he rather, you know, not using this kind of method that will set up, set people up 500 years later. Uh, and so he think far and he sees that like, I do not want to harm people. So that heart of his already overcomes uh, one who do the 3,000 meritors, did like Leo Fan when he started, he started small, he do it one by one, like in the leaf and uh, he do it from the leaf and shoots rather than the roots. But Mr. Liu goes straight to the trunk and the roots. So it, equal, it equates to everything. So one, one seed equals to the whole uh, branches and trees, something like that. So basically, um, if your heart, and then he goes further actually, he levels up as, as he goes. So he say, if you cultivate goodness without attaching to the goodness itself, to the notion of you doing good, uh, then whatever you do will always be perfect. That means whatever you do will always be natural, will always be uh, perfect. It's the wrong. But if your heart has attached to the goodness that you did, or the goodness itself, even though you do it a lot of good deeds, like what they say, 3,000 meritorious deeds, stuff like that, you only restrict it to half goodness. So the level of goodness you reach is half. The, the, the weight of goodness is only half. So, for example, using wealth to help, I mean, using money, monetary um, financials to help others, uh, you must cultivate um, no, non-attachment to the notion of goodness. So first, you must not see that you have done the good deeds. You must not see other people receiving from your good deeds. And you must not see the deeds itself as a good deed. Uh, that is what it meant by um, emptiness, the, 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 the doctrine of emptiness when we are cultivating uh, giving, parameter of giving. So this is what we call a pure heart. If we have that kind of level of cultivation in terms of uh, doing good deeds, that means you, you still have to do it. But when you do it, um, you do not say Dylan has donated $1 million. And uh, maybe Yenzi has received $1 million, uh, or maybe the charitable uh, UNESCO has received $1 million. And then uh, there's no notion of this $1 million has been donated for good cause. 
So you're aware of what's happening. You are doing what's happening without any form of regret or without any form of trying to get praise. So it, it just happened naturally by itself. If we can do that, then it's, um, it's what we call a pure heart. And this kind of heart, when you, you use it anywhere, treating any kind of people, doing any kind of thing, then even though your good deeds is a little bit, maybe you're helping people uh, with their, you know, uh, maybe walking through the streets, small stuff. But the merit that it accrue is un- infinite. Small deeds can accrue infinite merits. Doesn't have to you. You don't have to do like actually three thousand deeds for that, because your heart you have captured the roots of it. Your heart is right, and you're not attached. So you're not bound to a certain ideas on views, which is what we call erroneous view, erroneous ideas. You have attained emptiness, which is pure pure heart. So whatever you do is out of the pure purity of heart. There's no um, me, you he uh, and what in there. So one word can also help to resolve all the conflicts. Oh, yeah. Um, when we look at this word, we, we think about nowadays media has uh, pasted a lot of uh, those uh, you know, fake news or a lot of uh, one of those uh, not so, uh, they don't report a fact sometimes, they just speculate and speculate and they keep you know causing a lot of trouble and if there is a person who can um, come out and say the thing as it is uh, if we all learn how to do that then I think the society would be much more peaceful so this is what we, we talk by uh, one word can help you to resolve all the you know sins of the past so um, if your heart uh, if you haven't forgotten about this idea of goodness, this idea of me doing goodness. That means if you haven't attained emptiness, um, even though you have, you know, if your coffers have, you know, millions of dollars, um, billions of property, real estates, uh, your merit will never be full. Sorry, your fortune will never be, is not considered as full. So the good fortune that you accrued is only material. So this is re- restricted. People who have good fortune and their fortune is filled up to the brim to the maximum is a person who has a heart of an ocean because they don't have attachment to myself so their heart is not as narrow uh, as the ordinary people and this kind of person can take in uh, how to say all sorts of fortune into their into their uh, coffers we call it fortune coffers Xing Tian so this is what this is how we should understand about goodness and what we should strive towards, the level that we should strive towards. It's in, in Buddhism words, the first step is emptiness, guan kong, like able to go through all the attachments. So we're talking about the six um, pairs of goodness. The seventh pair is big and small. So big and small, how, how do we understand a Goodness is big, but goodness is small. Um, there is a very nice uh, example of a man who was being pulled down into the uh, lower realms. Uh, we call it the hell realm or Hades. And this King Yama, who is a judge uh, for those people who pass away in the afterlife and decide where they reborn in, he has asked this man who was only in his early 30, I think, he only reached 40, I think. He's very young. And he was um, say uh, he was asked, like, you know, we're going to measure your good deeds and bad deeds. And they use um, the, I don't know how to call it, do you know how to call it? The, the weight, the scale. Yes, the scale. And he puts all that bad thoughts that he has committed in his, uh, during his uh, living times in one side. And then he put, good deeds he did in the other side. So the bad deeds or bad thoughts he did is as much as a mountain, it's as tall as a mountain. The good deeds that he did is only one uh, slither of, <clears throat> one slither of, um, sorry, one scroll of goodness. So before they weigh it, they show it to him. Like you have a cart full of a mountain 
a cart full of bad deeds and you only have one scroll of good deeds that you have done in your life. And then he's like, I haven't even reached 40. Like, I'm almost 40. I haven't reached 40. How can I commit so much bad deeds? And he's not emperor or anything. He can't do much. So he, that's what he thought. And then this uh, King Yama just said, you don't need to wait for you to do it. If you think of it, it's already considered as a trespassing. So even thinking about this itself is considered as a demerits. So he put the demerits and the merits both side and they start to weigh it. Then when they weigh it, something strange happens. Suppose, supposedly he's um, a cart full of bad deeds uh, should be heavier than one scroll of good deeds. But what happened is when he weighed the good deeds, the good deeds is heavier than all one scroll of good deeds is heavier than the whole cart full of bad deeds. So he's very he's very um, astounded, and uh, so does everyone on the scene of the court. And this um, King Yama explained when he asked. So this Mister, sorry, this man is Mister Wei, okay, who's being judged. So King Yama said that last time when uh, there was a project to be launched by the government in, of ancient China of the government to build the bridge, you have. You have tried, proposed uh, to stop it because it uh, it takes a lot of um, manpower and a lot of resources that could be used better elsewhere. Uh, and these are not necessary. So uh, that is a good deed that you did. And then he's like, I didn't, it didn't even pass through. The emperor doesn't even take the advice. Well, if he takes the advice, it's heavier. The good side of your um, uh, deeds, uh, merits is heavier. Even if you just propose it, you propose it out of your um, heart that's trying to protect the people. So your heart is uh, good. So hence, the weight is heavier. The one you see in the back is just you thinking about yes, the good that you did. So obviously he will go to the better place. So um, in the in 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 the other words, it's not about how many activist activity we do or how many good cause we support or how many charity we have donated. It's about why you do it and how real. I mean, how sincere you are when doing it. When you pick on something to help you, you you want to do it out of your basis that you just do it because it's right and maybe you know you have condition you have affinity with this group so that's what's trying to say um this is what we call the big goodness um big goodness is not rely on how many um i mean how much money you donate or how many uh good deeds you did it's how sincere you are when you do it if it's sincere it's big no matter how small the deed is, by saving an end. So I'm just going to add a story on that one. Big deeds as well can save your life. So in the this one is one of those famous Zen monks, sorry, I think. There was a old monk sending his uh, young disciple, who was only like 10 years old or something, to go back to his own family because uh, he's, he has ability to see his past, present, future. And he has sent he, he has sensed that his time is up, even though he's young, maybe his uh, longevity is very short. He's going to die within a month. So he's like, uh, I supposed to I mean he's still young, right? He has not received full ordained monk hood. So should just send him back to his own family to pass the last month of his life. So when this young monk passed through the rivers on the way home, he saw there's a lot of uh, ants going to be drowned by the river. And obviously he has a heart of compassion at that moment. So he acts upon that compassion, take a leaf and acted like a boat and scoop up all these ants to the drier lands. And these ants were all saved. Just, just so small, small things like this, like saving lives, but saving ants' lives, not even human life. And after a few months, because the, 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 the young, the novice monk does not know, the young novice monk does not know that his life is going to end very soon. 
So he went back to his family home, have a nice you know, family gathering, and then went back to his shifu, uh, to his teacher. Uh, and then say, Shifu, I'm back. Uh, like, oh, you're back. You, you, do you know you're supposed to pass away within a month? It's like, what? I don't know. And then uh, Shifu was like, he, 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 he watched I me. Mean, he went into his meditative tranquility and see again and say, oh, because you saved the lives of the ants. So you, because you, when you do that, you do it, you know, you just do it. You don't, you don't have a lot of um, afflictions in there. So your act of deeds comes out of the purest of hearts. So your um, merits, longevity is a merit itself, has extended. Hence, you can live a longer life and cultivate better. So something like this, you know, like don't don't need to wait for something big to happen. You just do it from the small, everyday, practical um, part of your life. Then uh, it will accumulate by itself. Um, yeah, that's it. So. The last one, all right, I'll end up with the last one. What is easy? What is hard? Easy, easy goodness and hard goodness. So uh, there is a, a ancient, uh, how to say, the, the Confucius uh, scholars, the earlier Confucius scholars, they always use one word, say, if you want to try, if you want to work on your own uh, you know, cultivation, start from the hardest part that you're trying to uh, prevent, like, Start from the strong, I mean, the most, the hardest uh, part of your habit that you're trying to um, transform. Because um, that part of yourself is, uh, you have a strongest attachment. Um, for example, when some people ask Confucius about what is benevolence. And Confucius answered that person, start from the hardest thing uh, that you have to do. Like, for example, he went with an example. Uh, okay, so there was a man who is in uh, Jiangxi in China, and he's trying to save lives to protect uh, the lives of a family, a husband and wife, actually. He sell all his uh, property, real estate, all his um, uh, properties, real estate, sorry, um, and use that money to um, ransom back this uh, pair of couples and this money that he used is actually accumulated for 10 years so using 10 years of his savings to save others uh, this is what we call something hard to be given you have given so answer answer so something you don't uh, reluctant to give usually but you're willing to do it uh, another case is this one is more ancient times, but there is a old man who has no children, and there is a person because he has a position. Some people send their own young children to, I mean, like twenty years old, like very young, to this old man as a concubine in a sense. Um, and he has it was a common practice back then. All right, and he can't take it without repercussions from the society. However, he says that this is too young and supposed to be with her people of their same age. So he sent it back and said, no, it's not something I should do. So something, you know, common people might, you know, easily say, uh, young woman, right? And then they just want it. But he is able to suppress uh, lust and all that and uh, send it back so that this woman has a happier life than sticking with an old man. So person who can do it, you know, start uh, open surgery on their own habits from the most painful and most uh, uh, attached, um, hardest part. Uh, the heavens will reward them the most, uh, the thickest form of uh, gift. Um, and then he used that to say that if person with prestige, with power, with wealth has um, this ability to do good deeds, Right, because they have influence, they're able to influence the society to do uh, to 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 direct them, di even direct the whole uh, you know, culture and all that into that uh, better one. But if you do, if you can do that, but you do not want to do that, it's what we call the um, self abandonment. You're abandoning yourself because you're not uh, enriching your merits, not enriching your virtues. People who are poor 
for example, the young the young lady before she become imperial concubine, she's poor. But even though it's hard to cultivate goodness, she still do it. You know, she still donate the that two dollars that she has in in herself. Maybe it's, it's her whole property. I mean, it's it's that much she has. It's what we call um, rare indeed. So if we um, you know, in our daily encounter, if we have chances, like people asking for help and stuff like that, something like that, and we do it uh, to the earnest of our ability, even though it's a bit reluctant, maybe it's a little bit above your um, uh, ability to take it, you know, this uh, request, but you still do it regardless. Obviously, this merit is uh, what we call full, fake, uh, real. So everything we say good about the proper, straight. So this is the hardest one, but it's the most uh, uh, fulfilling one. Because once once we, uh, once you come and reap what you sow, then you will understand why, and you will do even better and better. So the l last part of chapter three is about uh, 10 ways of doing good deeds. So the first one is talk about, there's three small parts under the chapter three. The first one is just stories. They talk about stories to give you an um, impression. Okay, this is good deeds. These people are doing this good deed, that good deeds. And then it gives you an uh, understanding of what is actual good deeds and what is apparent good deeds. And um, this you need to use your life to experience it uh, instead of uh, on a textbook. And the last one, he just uh, gives us a very basic examples of well, what considered as good. So they're they're quite they're quite repetitive in a sense, I in my opinion. But um, they're just trying to emphasize uh, how how we can do better. So I'm not going in depth to it um, because I I would prefer to have uh, more uh, progressions in terms of uh, the the theory. Uh, so I'm just gonna briefly say there are ten examples of good deeds. The first one is be kind. Second one is be loving in your heart. The third one is um, complete others. Always trying to complete others, whether their relationship or whether their career, whether their wish, complete them. Help them to complete it. Uh, number number four is um, always give good, uh, kind advice to others. Always advise others to be kind. Number five is uh, saving others in need, helping others in need. Six is to uh, trying to engage in any projects that benefits the community, like be it like a community project in your temple or community project in your neighborhood, neighborhood watch, something like that. Um, number seven is uh, donation. <laughs> donation. I'm very obvious. Number eight is protect the Dharma. Protect the uh, Dharma, but not just Dharma, like including like the Taoists, Confucius, anything that is good, anything that's trying to direct people towards uh, a kinder kind of uh, mindset that we should protect them. Uh, number nine is to respect, be respectful to the elders, to your boss, to your parents, to your um, to your brothers and sisters, and number ten is to be appreciative of the goods. So um, be appreciative towards uh, your prop, uh, your possessions. Um, the number ten, I would like to go a little bit in depth because a lot of um, people nowadays we have uh, richer, I mean, material wise, we have a, a more affluent right now. Like our material condition is better than twenty years ago, thirty years ago, even in Asia. Um, and what happened right now that is not good is a lot of food wasting uh, in canteens and stuff like that because they can't finish foods. And it started from young people, like started from primary school, secondary school. And I saw a lot of documentary and how many food they throw away in one day uh, in China, in US, stuff like that. And when I look at other examples, good examples, I look at Japan and how they trying to educate all the young kids 
So this is something that we should all learn from is uh, the food portioning. It must be right. And because food sustains life. So food, in ancient Chinese saying, it's equals to heaven. Like, uh, the common folks treat the food as the heaven because without food, they might as well die. So if we treat food, which is one of the most important things in the human existence, one of the most important things in human existence, like a trash, then we don't deserve to have any uh, merits. And this is what happened exactly in our society right now. Uh, with the industrialized world, everyone can produce huge amount of food uh, in such a short amount of time. But obviously, it has to come from somewhere, which is the farm. And all the work and all the stuff goes in there. And if you produce this much, you're trying to they produce on the basis of profits. And because on the basis of profits, it's not based on how many people need it. It's based on how much I can sell it. And this kind of mindset, which was already being um, criticized by the Confucius back in uh, 1800s and in the earlier time, the reason why they're trying to suppress the level of merchant to the lower level, Sunong So start from the scholar, the people who study these classics, and then the farmers, and then the artisans, and the last one is only the merchants. Because people who think only from the perspective of profits, they are not good. That's just pure profits because they're chasing profits for the sake of profits. They didn't understand the whole eco ecosystem of, of the world. So these people, if you use them as the top of the society, which is what happened to us right now, and I have been, I'm working in the bank. So it, it's, it's, it's harmful to the society in the long run. Yes, you can have the rockets flying to the Mars. You can have all that technologies, uh, but you go like nuclear bomb and you have all the convenience of that stuff. But these are short terms, just like Atlantis. Maybe it's not real. Maybe it is. One day or another, we will exhaust the, uh, the resources. So this is something about goodness. It's not just for your personal benefit. It's about how it sustain for many generations to come. There's a reason why uh, Zhuge Liang does not invent, uh, does not continue invent during the Three Kingdoms. He could have invented like a machine tank, uh, mechanical tank back in uh, the Han Dynasty, uh, end of Han Dynasty, which is 1,200 years ago and further. He could have invented that. It could have been the strongest uh, nation. But what's the point? You can, because when people start, you know, uh, be seduced by all this uh, material comfort, they will eventually end up doing something what we're doing right now, nuclear bombs and all that. So, <clears throat> going back to the point, what I'm trying to say is uh, being kind is not just about yourself, it's not about uh, I want to be kind, it's about how my kindness uh, actually helps uh, my, my society, my people um, to, to live a better version of life than I have right now. And that's what we should all strive for. That's what the education should be aiming for, rather than just technical part. And all this 10 stuff sounds like a normal, like a very um, straightforward thing, but uh, we should appreciate its simplicity, its um, straightforwardness, because so so much has um, muddled nowadays the value, the morals, the virtues. Uh, the norm is not uh, as clear cut as before. And obviously, we can't use 100% of what people use in the past. But there are something that does not change. Benevolence, uh, being loving, um, being uh, frugal when you spend stuff. Being frugal, not stingy. So the number 10 is about frugal. Frugal means you can cut down as much material comfort for yourself. You should cut down. We call it minimalist. When you look at modern times, that's always very interesting, right? Back in the as much advancement as possible. But nowadays, the modern people, they are getting sick of it, of that kind of mindset. It's starting to go back to a little bit like a like, because to others, you should be generous. Uh, it should be as much as you could be because it is helping people doesn't matter whether it actually help or not.
because the kind person who met, but you see to help them. And just give, you just give as much as you can. For yourself, you always must be treating the old things with love and kind. Don't throw it away when you can, as much as you could. So the rest, like protecting the Dharma. How do we protect the Dharma? I can expand using the fun because we're going to end chapter three today. So we might as well go in a uh, bad way. Uh, so I'm going straight to uh, uh, protecting the Dharma because it's quite close to us. Um, without the sage teaching, like what I'm reading right now, uh, we do not, we, it's as in we do not have our eyes. Without eyes to clear the path to us, how can we, how can we uh, understand what is right, what is wrong, not what we learn, what is real goodness, what is false goodness. And protecting the Dharma means you're protecting the eyes of all sentient beings. You're protecting their eyes so that they are not blind and walk into the wrong path. So it's not just about protecting this religion or that religion. It's about protecting um, the heart, uh, not the physical heart, the heart, the spirits of this community, uh, keeping them alive, keeping them humane, keeping them kind. Uh, otherwise, it becomes like what we have experiencing, started to experiencing, a machine, a mechanical society. Everyone just trying to produce as much as much and their heart is empty. Not in the Buddhist way, but empty as in like a wood, a stone. They become machine, mechanical, or their creativity is bound. Their life is miserable. So, so this is why we need to protect Dharma because it helps them to liberate from that uh, problems. Um, be respectful towards the sage. Because every sage, right, is um, thinking about the world. If they are thinking only about themselves, they are no longer sage. They are normal people like us. But if they are strive, aspiring to think just for the world, right, like small sage think about this world, big sage think about the universe, the whole thing, because their vision gets bigger and bigger as they cultivate deeper and deeper insights and meditative tranquility. Um, Respecting them, it's not about them, it's about what they represent. They represent a potential of humankind to extend their wisdom, that goodness, that ability to actually be a human. Um, in Chinese words, human is equal to heaven and earth. That importance of humanity is as powerful as what we call it the heavens, which is the one that, you know, the weathers, the climates, the whole uh, laws of cause and effect, and Tian Di Ren, San Fa. Uh, and then the earth that nurtures the whole uh, land, like nurtures us, nurtures our whole family and generations to come. Humans is, is equally important as them. To be that sort of human, you need to have um, a heart that is as big as heaven, and a heart that can take as much as that. Earth. Only then you will be considered as, in Taoism, we call it Zhenren, real human. So, so if we use that kind of mindset, I diverge, but it's still under the point. If you use that mindset to think about our, our current society, ourselves especially, we've been a fake person for a long time, a fake human for a long time. And a real human is the one that, you know, live with the heavens when the earth is one. In a very practical way, a sense, everything they do is not machinery is not calculative everything they do is as natural as you know the spring blossoms the winter uh, they will uh, start to, 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 uh, sorry spring blossoms autumn leaf falls everything has a season so this is kind of the mindset we should have and sage always follows this law they will never forget about this law and they they will always use that law to benefit everyone so it's something we need to use our life to experience. How do we become a real human? I think, think about that. Uh, we can think about activism and all that, but that one is still very pretentious. It's not enough. It's not getting to the heart. The heart is the heart of the matter is the heart. Uh, the heart of the matter is the heart. So the root of it, the the mindset, like Master Ching Kong mentioned about the 
uh, water experiments. If the um, kindness of the people has accumulated to a certain level, it can purify the environment. And they tested it in Japan using a lake as an example. Um, why is it? Because we are in the scientific world, we should use this example. Um, this lake is dirty in Japan. And this old monk uh, was invited to host, he's a Buddhist monk, host a ceremony, just maybe a chan, uh, chanting uh, sutra. Actually, he was not told to chant sutra. He was told to lead everyone to think about one thing and one thing only. And all the disciples, about 50, 60 people, it's quite a bit, uh, bit of people, not a lot, but 20, 30. I forgot the numbers, but um, these disciples and this master, they're all thinking about one thing. Please let the lake water be clean. Usui Ganjing, Usui Ganjing in Japan. Um, and they use one hour, I think, just focus and concentrating on this dead water that is the lake. After an hour, it has been purified. Uh, the, the, the pH level is balanced now, no longer acidic. So everyone's like, thought really can change things. Uh, there's a reason why Master Ching Kong has been emphasizing it every single time he talks about it. Because right now we talk about science. Let's talk about science. But we talk about science in terms of quantum physics, not in terms of Newtonian 1800 science. That's outdated. We're talking about modern science getting closer. This kind of thing gives us confidence that what we are learning in Liao Fan is not about just trying to go back to Ming Dynasty. It's about how these people from Ming Dynasty um, or people in, from the ancient times uh, in our culture, you know, Confucius, they all teach us to be kind, to be good, to be respectful, be fearful, be relevant towards the spirits uh, because of the repercussion from them. In a more scientific term is everything you do reflects on the material world. And the material world, like the crystallization of the water, they can understand what you're talking about. So they have ability to hear, ability to see, to smell, uh, to taste, to touch. It's just that they don't have developed so much, we call it evolution, right? They have not evolved so much to have that uh, features apparent. But Think about our body. We're made out of water, a lot of blood cells and all that. How do they work together? I, this is something very interesting to read uh, if we develop out of these um, good books. All these things has ability to do it. And then when they accumulate together, so we are zhongsen. In, in Buddhism, we call it beings. Uh, more accurate thing is conditioned beings, conditioned existence. Who is not a conditioned existence? I am conditioned, I'm made out of blood, bone, flesh, and my flesh is made out of a lot of small stuff. The table is also conditioned beings. The table is made out of wood, fibers, and all the metals that works together. So everyone is conditioned being. That means if I can see and hear and touch, my blood cell can see and hear and touch. It's just the ability to do it is lesser. It's just the degree of doing it. So going back to uh, the water experiment, it, trying to prove it, that uh, we should not separate our material world with our uh, psychologies, with our uh, spiritual side of ourselves, psychologies. And we should not just psychologize everything as well. Uh, everything should be connected, should be life. It's not just in your mind. Um, the reason why we do not have the ability to transform things outside is because our heart is not pure. What whole they are finally trying to say in chapter 3 is that all these people who can accumulate up to 3 years or 5 years for us, chanting Amitya for 3 years or 5 years, it, it will transform into a material changes. Maybe in the form of going to pure land. So our energy level has improved. No longer bound by this lower frequency. We call it the human world. We're going to the better world, which is higher frequency. And just like a water crystal experiment, if, if people keep thinking bad things and the crystal will crystallize ugly, they, they, they tested it in the, in, the, in the 80s. They're still testing in Tainan, uh, Pure Land Temple. They have a experiment. They bought million dollars set up just to get this like, point across to the UN. So, so the whole point is, if you want to change your material condition, 
you got to have to start from your heart. You have to start from the thoughts. And that thought first is very pretentious. Unfortunately, it has to be like that. You have to pretend to be good until you are actually good. Uh, in Chinese, like you act something that you want to be, the idealized version of yourself, until you become that person. Uh, so, same thing for us. Yes, uh, what Leo Fan say, you know, I might not be able to do, like especially San Lun Ti Kong, which is what we talk about, non-attachment to the givings. You have to do the givings, but you must not attach to the givings. There's no me who give, there's no you who receive, there's no things that were given. So these three things must be empty. Empty as in you do not have the concept attachment to it. You're aware, but you're not attached to it. So those are hard because we always think about, oh, I give that person $10. Next time he owes me a gong cha or a bubble tea, something like that. But um, in a serious way, a, 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 a Leo Fan, if you want to make it alive, we must not take it in a textbook value. But we also must not attach to the idea of, you know, um, uh, yeah, everything's empty. You know, why, why am I, why am I learning this book? And Buddha telling me, you know, go into, into emptiness. Then you misunderstood Buddha. You know, Buddha does not. If he's, if everything's empty and should not do anything because it's empty, then why, why does Buddha come down here and tell you forty years of the sutra? You might as well say, just, you know, aware of the emptiness. Bye bye. No, right? And he might as well just go ahead and say, just chant Amitabha for bye-bye. Unfortunately, we are not like that. We need understanding. Hey, what does it mean, sir? And then he's like, okay, if you want to know what it means, here's the sutra. He starts with the Ahat. The Ahat sutra, because we're a Buddhist community, so Ahat sutra is talking about this. Cause, effect, be good to your parents, be kind to you. Nothing, no good religion or no good teaching, education leaves this one. So you can imagine our modern education, how far it has departed from humanities. So good luck to us. We still have 9,000 years of Dharma age, so a lot of hard work to be done. Um, going back to the main point, this is my um, uh, I would say. This is my uh, view, uh, not view. This is my, uh, yeah, my opinion on this uh, matter. If anything I say has... Um, going against whatever the teaching is, then please correct me if I'm wrong. So the stories, uh, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm not going too deep in there already because we already talked about it. Uh, yeah, the Dharma one, I already have uh, talked about it. It's very important. Um, just trying to get through this uh, properly. I mean, this is this is the kind of thing we need to just repeat again. We get into that, um, like like you say, you keep acting until you get it. You keep shin shin down the way. You keep um, immersed, infused until you actually smell like that thing. Infused lavender, you smell lavender, right? Um, I myself have not been infusing enough, hence my um, stuttering in my words. So, shall we end this?